First Muslim event ever to run eight minutes late. Yeah, so that's a, it's a nice achievement. Hopefully next year or maybe 20 years time we can you know start on. And it's actually one of the first Muslim events where the brothers are outnumbering the sisters, which is uh, just amazing. So clearly there's no football match on tonight. Yeah. Um, now to get to the crux of the matter. Uh, I'm sure all of you have already heard about um, some of the talks that we have planned. This is the first of a series of talks, student-led talks, that will be held on the BOTS campus, delivered by students for students. Um, the second one that we have, which is in two weeks' time, yeah? Three. Three weeks' time, called Everyone's a Hypocrite. And the third one, which is it's either Islam or Medicine. So as you can see, the titles don't get any less controversial as they go along, yeah? Um, why are we doing these talks in the first place? Well, number one, we want to deal with controversial, <coughs> controversial or difficult issues on campus. Um, an important caveat is that these topics have already been addressed by scholars. So we're not winding, uh, wandering blind into unknown territory. We're dealing with topics that have been dealt with, but they still remain an issue on campus for one reason or another. The second thing, and the most the more important thing is that we want, through, the, through these talks, to stimulate discussion and conversation on campus. We do not want a debate. We hate debates. Yeah? Debates only bring people who just come and they just further entrench themselves in their own opinion. No one is willing to have an open mind in, in a debate. The ego is king in a debate. Uh, debate divides. We want to bring people together. We want to have a situation at Boards campus, we want to foster an environment where two individuals can sit down, they can have completely different principles, they can have completely different beliefs, but they can come to some kind of common ground, they can discuss with respect, with etiquette, not trying to have some kind of one-upmanship going on. We want to stimulate that kind of environment, because only through that environment can we actually come together. Um, so we want conversation, we want discussion, we hate debates. And hopefully through these talks we can take the first step in that direction. We're not saying that this talk is going to solve anything. Yeah? It's going to be the solution to all the problems of Bart's campus. It's just a simple, small, humble step in the right direction, we hope, inshallah. Yeah. This talk in particular, so boys and girls can be friends. So I'm hoping now that because we're talking about discussion and conversation, we didn't call it, can boys and girls be friends? Because that's a debate. And that only brings people who already know the answer to that. Yeah? It's a rhetorical question if you phrase it like that. Yeah? So we, don't, we didn't want that, we want discussion and conversation. So what's the purpose of this particular talk? Number one, we're going to be focusing on um, the nature of the relationship between boys and girls, between men and women. The interactions that occur between them. And what the ideal is, what Islam says the ideal relationship is between the two genders. Um, so that's what the first thing that we're going to look. And now I've slowly forgotten everything I was going to say, so now I'm going to refer to my handy iPhone. Yeah. Um, the second thing is we're going to present the ideal, not judge anyone by it. Our purpose is to be only one half of the conversation. The other half is you guys and everyone else on Bart's campus. So we're going to participate by presenting, you know, having our presentations, presenting what Islam says about the nature of the relationship between boys and girls, men and women. Um, but it's your job now, it's the job of people on campus to participate in the conversation by asking questions, by holding their own presentations, by asking for clarification, by having a discussion. Um, we're not going to be judging anyone by it. Most of us, if not all of us, in this room, right here, right now, are not adhering to the ideal that is against. <coughs> Let's be honest. But just because we're not adhering to the ideal doesn't mean we shouldn't present it. Imam Ghazali said that um, if you wait until you're perfect in order to do da'wah, you will never do da'wah. And no one will ever be able to do da'wah, except the Anbiya. Yeah? So it's a question of we're all in the same boat, we're all in the same sea, drowning, 
And it's a question of, this is a life jacket. Now whether it fits onto me, I don't know. I'm struggling because I'm an idiot. I can't wear this life jacket, yeah? I didn't watch all those airplane videos, yeah? Um, so it's not fitting on me, but maybe it will fit on you. So we're presenting the ideal, we're not judging anyone by it, nor should we judge anyone by it, nor does anyone have the time to judge any, anyone by it. Finally, this talk has almost nothing to do with marriage. I'm sorry, you know, if everyone came with the hopes of, you know, another flowery talk about the romance and all that, yeah? It has nothing to do with that, yeah? The relationship between a husband and wife is just one slice of all the interactions that occur between one gender. But for some reason it gets magnified as if it's the only interaction that occurs. So there are plenty of marriage talks that are available on YouTube and so on. You can refer to them. Um, to be honest, I don't think anyone here is going to get married anytime soon. Yeah? And then brothers like speak for yourself on it. Yeah? But, so let's deal with reality. Let's deal with the vast majority of the interactions that occur between the opposite genders. Um, and let's focus on that, and this is what this talk is going to be about. Looking at the whole picture, not just one slice. Some people think he's a brother, but, you know, the jury's out on that one. Um, <laughs> so, I'm not to and just intro this talk. Cool. So, Jazakallah Khair Abid, that's the shortest talk you've ever given. So, sorry from everyone, my yeah, name's Adnan. Um, and I'll be giving the first part of this talk, inshallah. So, the, today's topic is boys and girls can be friends. Again, I'm not sure why I was asked to give this talk. I, just like Abid, maybe I was confused for a sister, so I have two different points of view. So anyway, like Abid said, the point of these talks are for us to ponder and base our opinions on the principles which we follow, whatever they may be. And for exactly that reason, we haven't invited anyone who's more knowledgeable. We haven't invited a scholar and you've just got plain old me. So it's not just a regular talk. Um, it's to help us determine what we do throughout our lives and not just at uni. We're not here to tell you what's completely right, we're not here to tell you what's completely wrong, but we are here to tell you what we've observed and what we found out. And yeah, it's a, obviously it's a very sensitive issue and I've got a feeling that by the end of this talk I'm going to be hated by both brothers and sisters. But let's make a start, inshallah. So, <laughs> so gender relationships between Muslims, how are they now? On the one hand, you've got the relaxed, do whatever you feel like, no restrictions people, who may or may not fall into greater error. And then, on the other hand, we've got the hardcore, pro-complete segregation, where people avoid all contact, <coughs> no matter the cost. Now, the problem is that neither of these situations work well, and in my opinion, neither is actually correct. The first can and does lead to immoral acts and huge sins, whereas the second <coughs> leads to stigmatization of both genders, with men being treated as perverts who can't control themselves, and women being treated as temptresses who are nothing but objects to be gawked at. Both attitudes then cause problems <coughs> in society, and just one aspect of that just being when you do want to form halal relationships. So the question is, can boys and girls be friends? According to one side, this should be a simple answer, right? I mean, the answer is no. I mean, we all know how we have to lower our gaze, we know how we shouldn't be in seclusion together. Um, yeah, but then on the other side, what does it say in the Quran? In Surah al tawbah verse 71, and the believers, men and women, are protecting friends one of another. They enjoin the right and forbid the wrong, and they establish worship, and they pay the poor due, and they obey, obey Allah and his messenger. As for these, Allah will have mercy on them. Lo, Allah is mighty, wise. And then, if you think about it, based on that verse, I believe I could actually end my talk right there. But we, this is a discussion, so I'm going to go on. So, according to the Quran, we, the believing men and women, are protectors, helpers, and friends one of another. Now, that's something you would see in a working relationship. We work together to enjoy the right and to forbid the wrong. So, both boys and girls should be working together for Islam, don't you think? Simple. Now please make it clear, I'm not saying that it's okay for boy, or, or boys and girls to go free for all, no restrictions, do whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like. It's clear that it's not. We all know and have been told how men and women shouldn't be alone together, they shouldn't have any physical contact unless it's necessity, such as during a medical examination. But if it is a necessity, such as in Islamic work, or our work as medics or dentists or whatever, then we can and should work together. 
as long as it's with the correct manners, the correct etiquette, the correct other. There are plenty of examples of men and women working together in Islam, from Prophet Musa helping the women by watering their flock, to the women on the Battle of Uhud. But I'm going to leave that because I'm sure these lot will go into much greater depth than I will. So the problems arise on both sides of the scale. Now, Islam teaches us the middle path, and it's unfortunate that we end up taking it to one extreme or another. Either we're completely, fri completely friendly with the opposite sex and doing whatever we feel like, which is clearly wrong. We all know there's a line, and being completely honest, we all know when we've crossed it as well. Or we go the complete other way and have airtight barriers where we can't even breathe. Yes, I know, as brothers, we do have to lower our gaze. But that also doesn't mean we lower it so much that we end up crashing into the sister instead. <laughs> so it would just be like, oh, sister, I'm so sorry I crashed into you. It's just that I respect you so much. Now, please let me help you up. It kind of defeats the purpose, don't you think? So again, it all comes down to your intention. Again, I'm not saying we should get rid of these barriers at events because it depends on the actual event, on each individual basis. But we should have enough self-control that eventually these barriers shouldn't even be necessary. As far as I know, during the Prophet's life, uh, Masjid and Nabi didn't have barriers to separate men and women either. The, however, the Prophet did say to tell the men to leave a separate entrance for the women and for the women to stay at the back and men at the front. If we look at the references and the actual historical evidences, the rulings are quite clear. But again, I'm going to leave that for these guys to go into. Now, the problem is that unfortunately we've introduced a lot of culture into our lives and that's made it a turn for the worse and actually made us lazier. We'd now rather have barriers put in place rather than fixing our own intentions and purifying our hearts. Again, not saying we should throw out barriers because I know it depends on the occasion, but <coughs> the emphasis on purifying ourselves has been lost and some may actually say that having barriers is actually un-Islamic and goes against the spirit of Islam itself. Otherwise, why wouldn't it have been introduced in the Prophet's time? So, the last point I want to bring up is now that this is something we have to implement in all aspects of our lives. Plenty of people have spoken to me about this before, that whenever we have an Islamic event, we're all heads down, can't look up, or talk to the opposite gender. But when we leave the room, and then we go to the PDLs together the next morning, we're all chatting away, how's your day, blah, blah, blah. And it's actually quite funny, as if we're all Islamic during the event and then we're back to normal. Or we, and we all do it, including me. Everyone's a hypocrite. Oh, that's a talk in three weeks' time. So, and I bet it'll happen today as well. <laughs> it will happen today as well. Sisters will be scared to speak up because brothers are here, and brothers vice versa. Yeah, tomorrow morning when we have a PBL, we'll all be racing to shout out those definitions and psychosocial issues. Well, this is a much more important psychosocial issue. Okay? The way we act, both in and outside of these things, should be the same. Both should be with the correct manners, the correct etiquette, the correct other. We need to purify ourselves and correct our intentions, rather than just relying on things that our, that our culture has introduced, which make, us, which make us lazier and ease us on our responsibilities to respect one another and to work together. And with that, I think my time is up, literally. I'm going to go underground before I start getting death threats from angry brothers and sisters. Uh, may Allah forgive me if I've said anything wrong, anything wrong but I've tried to do, base my opinions on the Quran and the Sunnah, but I couldn't even dream to be knowledgeable enough in these things, and I'm going to pass it on to others. Um, by the way, sorry I was staring at my phone, I wasn't waiting for a text from a sister. Anyway. <laughs> 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 At the time, I've limited myself to your phone to, to see what happens. So as Allah has eloquently pointed out, there are two extremes that exist on campus. Yeah? And let this, let these presentations paint a picture for you guys. Yeah, we're slowly painting a picture. Don't think about dissecting each point as of yet. Just wait until the picture is done and then you can throw your tomato or whatever. Yeah? Um, but as I've not pointed out, um, there are two extremes that exist on campus. Yeah? Or in society in general. You have one extreme which says that basically it's like the Burger King advert, you know? Have it your way. Yeah? That's the Burger King mud hub, yeah? So. Free, it's a complete free fall, uh, you can do whatever you want to, there is no restrictions, unless you want to put a restriction, in which case you can draw the line wherever you desire, you know, because it's your conscience. And then you have uh, the other extreme, so the first extreme is basically the 
actual limitation that everyone has is as long as we don't physically harm each other, everything's good. Yeah? And if I want to put any more restrictions, it's up to me as a person. The other extreme is basically women and men have to live on separate planets. And if we interact, it's kind of like, oh, why do we have to interact? You know, the only time men and women are going to be interacting with this extreme is if the brother is dying and the woman is the only person in 40 mile radius. Yeah? And even then the brother might just you know, die because it's more noble to, <laughs> to interact with the sister. Yeah? Um, so as Adnan pointed out, men are characterized as perverts and as weak. I mean, my religious studies teacher, I remember when I was in year 10, she told the entire class that the reason that women have to lower their gaze is because men, Muslim, women, uh, Muslim men are physically weak. That's why, they, that's why men have to lower their gaze. Um, and that's nonsense. The reason why women, ha men and women have to lower their gaze is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them. Yeah. Not because uh, men are physically weak or women are, are, are temptresses that would, are just seeking to uh, you know, throw men into the dirt at every opportunity. Yeah. That's kind of like a Christian concept if you think of it. Yeah. Um, so you have the two extremes. And then you have Islam, which we all know is a middle path, which draws a line straight through those two extremes. Firstly, not because it's trying to avoid, not just because it's trying to avoid either extreme, but also because it's the middle path that actually leads to success, both for both genders and for society <coughs> in and of itself. So Islam is, you know, if you can think about it in your mind, if you can think about a path in between a desert, on either side, there's destruction. On either side, there's death. And in the middle, you have this, it would have been nice to have a picture of that, but even in, in the middle, you have a, a road, and that is Islam, the middle way. Yeah. So let's look at the middle path that Islam highlights. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْدَهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدَ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَيُطِيعُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَئِكَ سَيُرْحَمُهُمُ اللَّهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ there's a translation, I hope you guys are reading along as I was reciting. First of all, yeah, I hate you know, archaic translations, um, and I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Um, my references, I'll mention this at the end, yeah? but I have plenty of references. Most of the stuff, we've just jacked it from there. Yeah? So any bad stuff attributed to me, any good stuff, it's the references. Yeah? Um, but lo and behold, and that, forget that. Yeah? The believing men and believing women are supporters of one another, only oh, yeah. Yeah? They, they enjoin what is right, forbid what is wrong, establish prayer, give zakah, obey Allah subhanahu wa and his messenger. These people, Allah subhanahu wa have special mercy on him. I swear down, inna, yeah, Allah has the highest authority. Ex exalted and mighty and wise. I don't think anyone talks about that. Yeah. So let's look at that verse. First of all, awliya. Yeah? Um, some translations are friends, but that's not really appropriate or accurate, especially for us living here. <coughs> An accurate translation of awliya is protectors, maintainers, supporters. That's the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to define the relationship, the one word. He could have chosen any word, and he chose that one word to define the relationship between believing men and believing women. Supporters. He didn't say they were friends. He didn't say they were mortal enemies to one another, yeah, or oppressors and suppressors to one another. He didn't say they were, you know, PBL buddies with one another. Yeah. He said they were supporters. So that's important. That's something to keep in mind. That the one word Allah SWT use, uses is awliya. The second question that you think of is, well, supporters and what? Yeah. What are they supporting each other in? If we go back to the verse, we can see that they're supporting each other and encouraging what is right and uh, discouraging what is wrong. Commanding what is right, commanding what is wrong is a not so good translation. More accurate is encouraging and discouraging. Yeah. So encouraging what is right, discouraging what is wrong, establishing prayer, giving zakah, 
and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And as many commentators have pointed out, they're supporting one another essentially in doing everything that is good for humanity and protecting humanity from everything that is harmful. That's the crux of the issue. So this is what they're supporting one another in. They're not supporting one another in evil or slander or using one another. They're supporting one another for doing good and protecting society from evil, protecting humanity from evil. So those are two things that we need to consider when we're looking at this verse. Now, let's reflect on this verse. The first thing that you realize is, okay, if they're supporters to one another, number one. Number two, if they're striving for the same goal, yeah? They're supporting one another for the same goal. Wouldn't they naturally have the love and respect for one another? Wouldn't they naturally honor one another? If you're striving for the same, for, you know, if you're climbing a mountain and someone else is climbing the same mountain, isn't there this camaraderie between the two of you? Yes or no? Yes, yeah. So already we can see that Allah SWT is hinting that because you guys are supporters for one another and you're striving for the same goal, naturally you're going to have a love for one another. Naturally, you're going to respect one another. Naturally, you're going to help one another. Yeah? Because we're all in the same boat at the end of the day. Yeah, we're all swimming, floating, trying to float on the, on the turbulent oceans of this life. Yeah? And this love, it's important to clarify, right? this love isn't some infatuation, physical desire, obsessive kind of love. This is a love which is pure. This is a love of brotherhood and sisterhood. And we know this. Because that's why we love the female and male companions. That's why we love Jesus, <coughs> Musa salam, and Mary, Maryam salam. That's the same love, because they were supporting one another, and they were supporting us, and we're all striving for the same goal. So this makes sense, we're all in the same boat. The second thing that we can reflect from this verse is that this verse is a big <coughs> pathway. Yeah? And if you can think about it, back to that desert image, where you have this one road cutting across one desert. On either side, you have the two extremes again, predominated by selfishness. Yeah? So we can see a benefit from this, from believers, believing men and believing women being supporters to one another. Yeah? Because we're reflecting here. So on the one extreme, which is that uh, it's a complete free fall, you can do whatever you want, pretty much. Yeah? That's predominated by selfishness because at the end of the day, men and women are using each other, either to satisfy their physical desires or much more commonly to satisfy their emotional desires, <coughs> their self-esteem issues. Oh my God, you know, so and so looked at me. Oh, that made my day. Yeah, and I'm sure all the brothers are like, <laughs> I wish she was looking at me now. But um, that's that's very common. You know, because people have destroyed their self-esteem, they're looking for it from the opposite gender. And movies and music and that kind of stuff really pumps it into us. Yeah? So you have that selfish extreme. The other selfish extreme, which is that, no, we've got, we've got nothing to do with each other, we've, we don't want anything to do with each other, that's also selfish, because we're living in the same world. Essentially, you're saying, I'm not going to help that sister, even if she needs help. That's exactly what you're saying. Um, and that is selfishness as well. And so Islam charts a middle pathway again of selflessness. Yeah? No point having fingers. <laughs> um, it charts a middle, a middle pathway of selflessness where it encourages people, believing men, believing women, to support one another. If you're supporting one another, that's a selfless act. And if that spirit is nourished, then not only will you have successful marriages, yeah, because each person walking into the marriage is not thinking about themselves and themselves only. What have you done for me lately? Yeah, you do this and that, you never do that. Yeah? They're not entering it like a boxing ring. Yeah? So not only will they have a successful marriage, but more importantly, they'll have, you have a successful society. The reason society, we can all agree that one of the main reasons society is the way it is today is because of selfishness, because of the ego is king. Yeah? So this is what the Quran says. This is the thesis, this is the principle that the Quran builds male and female interactions around. Now, being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He didn't just say, this is the principle, now you have to figure it out on your own. He gave us some case studies. I will look at some case studies, Sultana will look at case studies at the time of the Prophet and the companions and the scholars and the activists. 
So these are some case studies that I want to look at. I want to look at two individuals, Musa a.s. and Maryam a.s. So with Musa a.s., Allah SWT, as Adnan referred to, the incident between the Musa a.s. and the two girls. Do you all know this incident? Show of hands, who knows this incident? Um, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَمَّا تَوَجَّهَتِ الْقَاءَ مَدْيَنَ قَالَ عَسَى رَبِّي إِنْ يَحْدِيَنِي إِنْ يَحْدِيَنِي سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ So this is the beginning of our journey. All of us in the audience, we're in Musa in some situation with respect to men and women's interactions. Yeah? And here, Musa Aysam is fleeing the persecution of the Egyptians. They want him dead because he accidentally killed someone. Yeah? So he's fleeing Egypt. Yeah? And he puts his hand out and he points <coughs> somewhere in the distance and he says, Allah SWT, guide me to that place. Whatever place that is good for me. And it just so happened that the uh, place where he's pointing towards is actually Madian. Yeah? So Allah SWT put something in his heart. And each one of us is in that situation. We're standing there, fleeing the persecution of confusion, yeah, and doubt, and our own thoughts. And now we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guide us in the right direction. Show us what men and women interactions are meant to be like. This is the famous incident between Musa Aysan and the two girls. Musa Aysan is now walking, he's come through a desert of the extremes. Yeah? And he reaches the bank of the river. Finally, he has no food or drink at all. He reaches the bank of the river. He's drinking some water, and he sits down. And he sees that at the bank of the river there are a huge crowd of men pushing each other and shoving each other, trying to get drink for their uh, sheep. And in the distance, somewhere on the hill, there are two girls pulling their sheep back. They've got two sheep, and they're pulling the sheep back. Yeah? So Musa is like, what, what the hell, what's, what, what's up with this? I don't understand what's going on. Yeah? A, why are these two girls getting drink for these sheep? Surely this is the job of a man, especially since you know, these men have no care or concern for any females. There's no place for a female to be. If they're pushing each other. I don't give a damn that, that these two girls are waiting in the searing heat, trying to get water for their sheep, and they just don't care. There's no place for a woman to be in, with these amoral men. So he's confused. And why are they pulling their sheep back? Yeah, because it's almost a wrestling match. That's what the Quran paints. So he goes up to them. And what does he say? Yeah? Did he say, Salaam sister. Yeah? Let's not say Musa Aysan. Yeah? But someone else. Salaam sister, what's going on? Where are you from? You know, how's everything? Oh, it's a sunny day today, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Is that sheep? Oh, how many legs? There are four legs. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not what Musa Aysan says. He goes up straight and he says, what's your problem? What's your problem? I don't understand the situation. Explain it to me. Straight, it's not rude. He's just, he's fulfilling his supporting relationship. He sees a problem. He, he knows that believing men and believing women are supporters to one another. So he goes and he tries to fix the situation. Yeah? And he says, what's your problem? Direct language. No faffing about. Yeah? What are the two girls reply back? Oh, handsome man, yeah? Oh, a built man. He has saved me. No, yeah? First of all, Musa Aysan was heavily built, yeah? So he was very handsome and he was heavily built. That's one thing. He didn't say, oh, you know, thank God you saved me, my knight in shiny armor, woe to me, yeah? Instead, what did these two girls say? They said, these men, we're going to wait until these men <coughs> finish with their sheep. Once they're finished, then we're going to go down. We're not going to rub shoulders with these non men. Yeah. They're going to be pushing us. They don't give a damn about us. So until they finish feeding their sheep, we're not going to go anywhere near. Again, look at their 
direct explanation of the situation. No more, no less. Exactly what needs to be said. Yeah? What does Musa Hassan do? Okay, I've understood the situation, but I need to speak to you for another five hours to just clarify the situation, sister. Yeah? No. He grabs the sheep without even saying anything. These two girls were like, what the hell is going on? Yeah? He grabs the sheep, takes them to the bank, yeah? pushes all the men aside, gives the sheep drink, comes back, gives them the sheep, and goes and sits down in the shade. That's exactly what happens. Yeah? So we can see that this is the Quranic example where believing men and believing women are supporting one another, where when they interact, it's direct, it's no harsh, but it's straight to the point. Yeah? They, they're solving the situation rather than feeding their own desires, yeah, which is what's needed. So Musa Islam goes back into the shade and he says, Musa Isa goes back into the shade and he says, Allah, oh Allah, if there is any more good deeds I, I can do, yeah? Faqir, yeah? Someone who is a uh, needy situation, Faqir, a good example for all of us is Dark Knight Rises where Bane takes that man and he breaks his back, yeah? That is Faqir. That literally means Faqir. Someone who breaks someone else's back, that's Faqir, yeah? Someone who has nothing else in life. Literally, his back is broken. Yeah? So Musa Asam, he's got nothing. He's homeless, he's fleeing persecution, he's a wanted man, no food, he's got nothing. So he's like, oh Allah, I need your help. And sustenance here risk is not just referring to house and money and wealth and so on, but he's saying that, oh Allah, I just did a good deed. If you have any more opportunities for me to do something like that, please, I'm in desperate need of that. So we can see that Musa is not shy from this situation. Any more opportunities for him to support his believing sisters, he's actually asking for it. This is the example of Musa Islam. Yeah? And we can see that by following this example, what happens for Musa Islam? Musa Islam, the girls go back, they tell their father, and so on, the entire conversation goes on. But what's the end result? Within a few days, Musa Islam not only has a job for at least eight years, from going from homeless to having a house, from having no job and no food to now having job and food for at least eight years, and he also gets married. He wasn't even looking for marriage, and he gets married. So he gets everything that everyone wants by following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. And that's the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. If you follow it, you'll get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you. The next case study is Maryam al -Islam, Yeah, So... <coughs> Maryam um, just a brief intro for Maryam Alayasam. Now I'm going massively over time, but <laughs> almost done, yeah. For Maryam Alayasam, um, first of all, Maryam Alayasam is the greatest woman on earth. The greatest woman that has ever stepped on earth. She's the only woman, Mary, she's the only woman to ever be repeatedly mentioned in the Quran. She has an entire chapter dedicated to her. So, of all the examples, and Musa is an example for us, the two girls are an example for the sisters, and the sisters are getting one more example, Maryam a.s. And we're getting Zakari a.s. Yeah? Maryam a.s. This is what the Quran says with regards to the interaction with her children. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا وَكَفَّلَهَا زَكَرِيَّةً كلما دخل عليه زكريا المحراب وجن عندها رزقه قال يا مريم أن لك هذا قالت ومن عند الله إن الله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب. This is the interaction between Zakaria and Maryam عليه السلام. Zakaria and Maryam عليه السلام are not mahrams. They're not related. Yeah, number one. Second thing is, Imam al Qutubi says the word used for Zakaria is a prophet, his relationship with Maryam is kaffala. Kaffala means more than just guardianship, as the verse says. Yeah. 
Kafala actually means that Zakaria a.s. was teaching Maryam a.s. in the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was teaching her the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And he was actively taking care of her. So we can see the supporting relationship rearing its head again. Yeah? Rearing its beautiful head again. Yeah? That Zakaria a.s. is looking after Maryam a.s. He doesn't say Astaghfirullah is a sister. Yeah? I have no business with sisters. He's taking care of her. He's teaching her. And the t various tafasir actually say that the scholars of the masjid, male scholars, used to compete to teach Maryam a.s. because she was such a bright student. That's how amazing she was. They used to compete with each other. That I want her to be my student. So that I can say she was my student. This genius. Yeah? The third thing that the Quran says, talks about mihrab. Zakaria a.s. enters the prayer chamber. Mihrab is a... The prayer chamber is a rubbish translation of mihrab. Yeah? Mihrab, again the commentators say that mihrab was a special room with an elevated position that was specifically built for Maryam al-Islam by the scholars to recognize her intelligence and her character and her modesty. So when she used to get taught, she wasn't taught by all the, with the, all the other students. She had her own room, her own elevated position and she'd be taught there. That's the respect they have for her. Finally, we look at the interaction between Maryam Alayhisam and Zakaria Alayhisam. First of all, the talking, yeah? Because Maryam Alayhisam gets his food out of nowhere, so Zakaria Alayhisam naturally, he's taking care of her. Where do you get this food from? She replies back, yeah? So we can see the direct conversation that's taking place. But not just direct conversation, this is a theme that runs with Maryam Alayhisam. Where she actually is giving da'wah to who? A prophet. Of all people, she's reminding a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does she say? She says that this food is from Allah. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for all, uh, for whom he wills without account. He can take care of everything. Zakaria alayhi salam. She didn't say alayhi salam, obviously, yeah. But she, he can take care of everything. And it's because of this reminder from Maryam alayhi salam that Zakaria alayhi salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Yahya alayhi salam. Because of this reminder. <coughs> so we can see Zakaria alayhi salam is supporting Maryam alayhi salam. Maryam is supporting Zakaria Alayhisam by reminding him and yeah, being an excellent student. The next example with Maryam Alayhisam is where Jibreel Alayhisam <coughs> meets Maryam Alayhisam. Yeah. In the Quran, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa says, "Qalat inni a'udhu bil-Rahman minka in kunta taqiyya." Now let's take this. In, let's put this into context. Yeah. When angels used to come down, they would come down as some of us may know. They used to come down in the form of the most attractive man on the face of the planet. Yeah. That's how angels come down because they're angels. Yeah. So these are Allah Subhanahu wa messengers. So when they used to come down, they used to take the form of the most attractive man. We know this with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi We know this with Luj Alaihi story. And the same was true with Maryam Alaihi all Maryam Alayhisam saw was the most attractive man. I'm not going to say Ryan Gosling because he's not attractive, yeah? But, <laughs> he's not for guys, yeah? Uh, but, <laughs> for sisters, think Ryan Gosling, yeah. Preston Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt, plus the most handsome man ever, yeah? And that might give some example, yeah? The most handsome man ever, walking towards a sister, yeah? What does she do? What is her re reply? Maryam Alayhisam knows that men and women are supporters for one another, but this is a middle path. She does not want to take a wrong turn. And the Quran gives examples of wrong turnings. Stay on this path. Avoid the extremes. Avoid the desert. So Maryam al knows that a man and a woman cannot be in the same place in a seclusion. Unless it's a, some dire emergency. Yeah? They can't be in khalwa. <coughs> we know this prophet said that if a man and a woman are alone, the third person is shaitan. Yeah? So a man and a woman cannot be in khalwa in seclusion. So she sees that this handsome man is coming towards me. We're going to be in seclusion. So she rejects it straight away. Straight away she says, I'm not having any of this. That's the first thing. So Maryam al supporting relationship, but she understands where the wrong turnings are. Don't take those wrong turnings. The second thing is, look at Maryam al genius and her supporting nature. Even though she's rejecting this environment, what does she say? 
the, the commentators say the reason why she said, I seek refuge in Al Rahman is she's giving da'wah to this person. I'm saying of all the names I could have chosen, I'm choosing Al Rahman. Because if Allah SWT is the most merciful, have mercy on yourself. Have mercy on yourself. Don't take this wrong turning. So she's giving da'wah to him. Yeah? That's the first thing. She's supporting his heart. She's rejecting the situation, but she's supporting his heart. That don't take this wrong turning. If you believe that Allah SWT is the most merciful, doesn't matter what crime you've committed, because she thinks this is a dodgy dude. Yeah? What crime you committed, she's reminding him the mercy of Allah SWT. The third thing is, she's teaching him. All in one statement. She reminds him that the only person who will heed the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is someone who has taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're God conscious, then you will follow the commands. So it's more important to realize that, to work on God consciousness, than to focus on the specifics straight away. So she's teaching him now. The only person who can implement this is someone who is God conscious. Yeah? So she's supporting him even when she's telling him off. And the final example, yeah, where, again, this is an attractive man. She's informed now that she will have a son. What does Maryam Aliyasam say? Yeah? Maryam Aliyasam, look at this beautiful, now we're looking at her speech with the opposite gender. Quote unquote, yeah? But this is an example for us. First of all, she uses a euphemism. When she's informed that she's going to have a son, she says, when no man has touched me. She uses a euphemism for describing the physical act of intimacy. So we can see the modesty in her speech when we're interacting with the opposite gender. Another wrong turning is if our speech is littered with filth. Yeah? And her example is pure speech. So she can remain on the straight path. So she uses a euphemism to describe the physical act of intimacy. The second thing, if someone can recognize this, is that she's saying, when no man has touched me, and I have not been unchaste. Doesn't that mean the same thing? Why does she have to say both? And again, the commentators, they say the reason why she said both is, this is a sensitive topic. For someone who's being modest, there's, she's giving more words than is actually necessary, because that's the modesty that she has. So we can see that the interaction between the gender, when it's a supporting relationship, should occur in seclusion. And the second thing is that it should be modest language. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare, yeah. Just needs to be modest language. And a lot of that us are quite good at that, mashallah. You know? And I've got the wrong words here. First here, I don't know why. No, no, actually I do have. Yeah. Um, so how can Maryam and Islam do all of this? Yeah? I don't know why I just did that, but how can Maryam Ali do all of this? Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ She was one of the qanitin. Obedient is not such an amazing translation. What's much better is she, her heart was devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who wants to be on the straight path, which is the ideal. Either desert will let, lead to death. This is the ideal, this was highlighted the Sultan of the by the Prophet and his companions and the scholars and so on. Someone wants to stay on this path, avoid the wrong turnings, and make sure there's not enough gas in your car to continue the journey. And that gas is devoting your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what qaniti means. Devoting your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A quick point on that is that if your heart is devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indirectly telling us that a woman is defined as a servant of Allah. She's not a wife. That's not her main definition in Islam. Yeah? Her main definition is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So, if her heart is de devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she should think first and foremost, what are my responsibilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking me? What are the responsibilities that he's entrusted me, me with? Not, oh my god, the men are going to go crazy if I start helping out in the ice hole. Oh my god, if I give a speech, the men will look at me and they'll just jump out the window because their hearts will become infatuated with me. Yeah? She doesn't, they don't think of that. They think, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask me to do? How do I avoid the wrong turnings? This for that. Yeah? So if we want to maintain to the ideal, 
we need to fill our hearts with the right gasoline. Mm -hmm. Finally, the reward, which I said finally, ten hours ago, the reward for someone who is, maintains this ideal, who avoids the wrong turnings, who devotes a heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reward for this person is the verse straight after the first verse. Surah Tawbah, verse 71. Where is the reward? Verse 72. Yeah? What's the reward for someone who's supporting the other sister? What's the reward for someone who supports believing men and believing women, who support one another for good and protect against evil? What's the reward for that person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعْدُ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْحَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَمَسَاكِنَ طَيِّبَةً فِي جَنَّاتِ عَدْنٍ وَرِضْوَانُ وَرِضْوَانُ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ This is the reward for someone who maintains the ideal. This is the verse afterwards. You can't say no, no. But the Abhijah is speaking about, you know, some, you know, someone who struggles in the way of Allah. No, the verse straight after. This is what Allah SWT promises. For someone who maintains the ideal um, and avoids either extreme. With regards to gender interaction, everything else in life. That's it. Sankhwa. So um, we've seen already how the Quran mentions and even gives examples of how men and women are supporters of one another, awliya means supporters. And the principles apply to the interactions between our beloved Prophet وسلم, and the women in society. And even after the Prophet, his sahaba, his family and many of the early and late scholars, they have also adhered to the same principles. And so for my part of the discussion, I'm going to take you back to the sandy days of caravans and camels of Arabia. And I'm going to highlight just a few examples from the past, <coughs> from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi time. Uh, okay. So um, this is the ayah that, you know, so you've read it all, um, telling us that men and women are supporters of one another. And it's essential to highlight all the important genuine interactions from the past and mention specific women who have contributed significantly to Islam to show us that not only men, but women as well have been at the forefront of Islam's progression. And there's a vast list of examples that I could tell you about. In fact, a research fellow called Muhammad Akram Nadwi, he's a chef from the Oxford Center of Islamic Studies, he found more than 8,000 biographical accounts of women who have played vital roles in Islam, whether it be learning or progression in general. But today I'm going to highlight only a few of these examples. So, the first woman I'd like to tell you about is Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, who is the second wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She was well known, for her, well known for her knowledge and for her enthusiasm for and for both genders. She encouraged studying for men and women. And she has been reported to have narrated more than 2,000 hadiths. One of the Sahaba actually said, I did not find anyone more proficient than Aisha in the knowledge of the Holy Quran, the commandments of the halal and the haram, the lineage of peoples and Arabic poetry. And it's even why senior companions of the Prophet used to go and consult Aisha in resolving intricate issues. And here you see the interaction between the male Sahab and the Sayyidah Aisha, which shows how these men used to go seek knowledge from this lady. And it demonstrates that women can be teachers of, to Islam to both genders, not just to women. And they can take on roles of knowledge and leadership within society. And again, it shows you how women, such as Sayyidah Aisha, were supporters of men in their pursuit of knowledge. So the second example I'd like to tell you is, I want to remind you of the story of Ghar Thawr um, during the Hijrah, when the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr عنه, were hiding in the cave, you know, the nest and the spider and all that. And Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, عنه, she was actually pregnant at the time, but she was the one who used to travel from Mecca all the way to the Ghar every day to supply them with food and water. <coughs> and subhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, said, he referred to her as the girl of two belts. And why the two belts? because she carried the food in these two belts and some scholars have interpreted the nickname as the Prophet's intention to refer to her as the woman who replaces two men. And this example shows us how this young girl, she was a very young girl, she took on this physically tough role. I mean, the days they didn't have buses or taxis or trains, she was walking from Mecca to the Ghar. And in fact, because of, the, because of her role, she was held in high esteem. 
And it shows us that shows us that how this young girl supported her father and the Prophet. Ashifa bint Abdullah was actually one of the earliest doctors in Islam. And she was actually appointed by um, Umar ibn Khattab and the Sahaba as the overseer of the marketplace in Medina, in Medina which is like the modern day stock exchange. And she was actually appointed she, because of her knowledge, because of her status in society. And here is an example of an extraordinary woman who was the arbiter between merchants. And here the example shows you two types of interactions. One was the actual appointment of her position, her allocation of a significant role within society, a very male dominant area. These merchants were mostly men, they were not women. Yet she was the arbiter between them. She was the one who tried to achieve justice if that merchant was trying to achieve the other one. And subhanAllah, this was so successful that another woman was appointed in Mecca, Samra al Asadiya, and she was actually also this a stock exchange manager in Mecca. And another doctor, subhanAllah, so many female doctors, um, Rufayda al Aslamiya, she actually had her own clinic outside the Prophet's mosque, and um, she used to heal men and women, so non mahram, and she used to heal them. And the Prophet encouraged this. He didn't say, no, you cannot heal this, this man because he's not your mahram. You're doing khair for the ummah, you're doing khair for the society. You can do it, it's halal. And this here shows that there is a beneficial interaction between a female doctor and her non mahram male patients. And subhanAllah, Rufayd and others such as Umm Salim and Umm Atiyah used to go out in battle and actually aid the soldiers. And women were not required to participate in battle, but there was an option for them to contribute if they wished. They weren't left behind, but they were actually side by side with the Prophet and the Sahaba in this epitome of this masculine environment, the battlefield. And um, subhanAllah, they, they supported them in their endeavours and what they could do. So they, uh, they healed the injured, they watered the soldiers, they did what they could. And subhanAllah, there's an actual example of a female Sahaba called Nusayba bin Tukar, who actually personally defended the Prophet during the Battle of Uhud. So she actually participated in the battle because she wanted to, because she felt that she was contributing this way. And there are many more examples I could go on about which can highlight the individual interaction with the Prophet and the women during those times. But essentially, they all reflect the Prophet's actions. The Prophet's actions were so comforting and supportive that he was approachable by all members of society, women and men. The Prophet ﷺ is our mu'allim, our teacher, and through his actions he has taught us how to create a society based on equality, respect and appreciation for one another. One gender does not have the upper hand in anything. And even after the Prophet ﷺ's time, there are many accounts of women scholars who were pioneers of education. The first degree-granting university, al Qarawain. this is a picture from al Qarawain Mosque, but it's in Morocco, it was actually founded by a woman, Ms. Fatima al Fihri. And this university was regarded as the leading spiritual and educational hub for all. And subhanAllah, it produced many of the great thinkers of our time, such as Ibn Arabi. And another Fatima, a Fatima of Damascus, who was an 8th an eighth century scholar who taught and celebrated the works of Sahih al Bukhari. And she was known, um, I'm sorry, there were accounts that during the Hajj period, Leading male scholars would actually go to her and actually go seek this knowledge from her. And these examples that I've just mentioned shows us how Islam encourages women to be equal in acquiring knowledge and that they support each other, they can help each other in gaining this knowledge because ilm is a big part of our deen. I think that if we compare the status of women during the pre-Islamic period, we will see that Islam has liberated women, giving them a higher status within society, allowing them to be proactive and exhibit initiative. Islam has broken down the barriers which has made women inferior to men and in fact has introduced the concept of ummah. Ummah means nation, community. Where, the, where both genders are empowered within society. Because it doesn't work when you have two entities functioning separately. We have to be supporters of one another. And we are equal, men and women are equal, but we are equal in different ways. In fact, men and women complement each other, again, supporters of each other. Because one gender cannot fulfill all the relevant roles within society. But you ask yourself, so why did all these interactions work? And I think we would all agree that it's because they were all striving for high levels of Iman and Taqwa, which enabled them to really purify their intentions and allow them to have these types of interactions in these communities. 
And it's important that we don't abandon this relationship and in fact strive ourselves to achieve this community and achieve these interactions with the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba, his family and the early and late scholars had with each other. And subhanAllah, that's why in Islam we have elements such as lowering the gaze, hijab, adab in the way that we interact that enables to have these interactions openly because essentially it is needed to create a fully functioning society within Islam and particularly we are an ummah. And the Prophet وسلم, said, الدين معاملة الدين is behavior and our deen should be reflected in our actions and in all aspects of our lives the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari is all about intention Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reported that إنما الأعمال بالنيات indeed your actions are defined by your intentions and I hope that today we will all agree that if we continuously renew and purify intentions then we could all achieve an environment where both genders can cooperate in a multidisciplinary approach supporting one another and this is something that we're going to um, explore in Jawad's talk, inshallah, where we highlight the importance of intention and how we, co uh, how we bring it in with the practicalities <coughs> of day-to-day -day living. Thank you very much. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you for coming. And um, as, as Abi said, this is more of an interactive session, so you've heard a lot of talks. But now what we're going to aim to do is we're going to currentize what they've said and see how, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, um, how these examples pop up and really, you know, what, what is the best way we can implement, you know, the wonderful things we've heard uh, from <coughs> the uh, speakers. <coughs> right. Um. Okay, so um, the, the believing men and believing women are allies of one another. They enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong and establish prayer and give zakat, charity, and obey Allah and his messenger. Those Allah will have mercy upon them. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Okay, so once again, the word awliya is translated as helpers, supporters, protectors. Friends is not really kind of, as Abi as pointed out, it's not really kind of the correct translation as such. Um, hence, you know, it's not, it doesn't really mean free forwards in the Western context. Best is probably helpers, supporters, and protectors. Um, and so, you know, what, the, what this means is that there's, kind of, there's an interaction, but it's based within a set of basic guidelines to keep that interaction healthy, not just for the individual, but for society as a whole. Because Islam <coughs> is not just, as I've mentioned, not just for an individual, but as a society. So, a brief uh, overview of the ten rules. <laughs> Okay, so the first one is your intention of dealing with the other gender is sincere. Now, this is actually probably one of the most important, uh, with ten, with ten of them of course, and if you keep this one correct, the others will naturally fall into place and are much easier. Um, if, you keep the, if you keep your intention right, then your, kind of, your aim for doing the act is um, correct. So let me give you an example. So, for example, Abi mentioned Musa al um, when where there was an opportunity for Musa al to do good, to enjoy what is good, as is mentioned in the verse. So, to currentize that, so if, um, say if you had the example of the sister <coughs> who you needs help, say um, you know they're on the underground and there's a woman and she can't quite uh, carry her pram up the stairs. Um, now you have the opportunity that that's an opportunity for you. But this opportunity has employed two main characteristics. One, it can cause you good and it can cause you harm. How can it cause you good? You help and you keep within the limits which will be mentioned and which Arvid um, has explored. But how can it harm you? If you go outside that. So um, your intention may be, okay, oh, so you know, I can have a chat or you know, that person can get to know me, I get you know, attention uh, for my own self. This will lead to harm. But the other option is to stay within the boundaries and you attain good. The other one is your interaction is purposeful. As I said, we'll go into these in more depth with kind of like scenarios, you know, almost like a PBL scenarios. Um, but yes, yeah, so your interaction is purposeful. So there's actually there's a need for it. Um, is it actually so? For ex uh, an example, would be say um, again, I'm going to use the example of a PBL. Um, you need to know what the scenario is, and you have say five people in your group, and you decide to text say a female, there was no need for that 
if you there was already say someone else you could get the objectives off. Um, so make sure there's actually a need for it. Otherwise, again, you know, that dives into the first one again with your intention. Because if there's no need for it, then your intention is already skewed from the beginning, and it can lead um, to not following the kind of correct rules as such. Um, your aura, again, uh, we'll go into this more, but again, that's just kind of you know making sure you're well dressed um, and not just that it kind of your even mentally like your modesty is not just how you physically dress yourself, but how you act uh, with other people. Uh, yeah, you lower your gaze at the appropriate time, so you're not just kind of going. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, <coughs> as a Nazi, you're you know, just looking down at the time, but you know, there's kind of a level. You know, I think, you know, we all know when we're crossing the line, so it's just kind of maintaining the kind of right boundary. And I think that's quite self-expansion, you know, you're not absolutely secluded with uh, someone of the off gender who's a non-moral. Your reputation is printed, this we'll go into. Anand came up with a very good example of this. You do not physically touch one another. This is, um, again, rather self explanatory. Uh, you, you respect each other's personal space and comfort levels. Now, both of those are key. Uh, in terms of personal space, you know, maintain a distance. If someone's not comfortable with it, you know, just stay away. Or if, say, you know, there's a sister and you, and you need to, that communication is essential and she's shy, then maintain, you know, understand that she's shy and respect that. And, you know, don't cross those kind of boundaries. Have, re you know, have a kind of level of respect. Uh, speaking in a decent manner, um, again, you know, that's uh, quite self-explanatory, so, you know, not just the way you speak, but the content of what you speak in. And this isn't really, not just, this isn't, this isn't just for rather assist interaction, but, you know, for all interactions, you're, the manner in which you speak in should be decent, because it's, it's a way that you kind of broadcast yourself, it's how you represent yourself um, to the general public, so always make sure that you're, you're, what you do, you talk, the content we're talking about is decent and the language which you're using is of a good nature. Uh, and your circumstances are safe, so um, uh, again, uh, Anand came with a very good example of this which we will come to. So yeah, you know, all of these guidelines, they're not just something which we've thought up from, they're from a source, and they are based on Islamic texts, and they're, you know they're there for a reason. So uh, I think Abid, you know, he more or less already covered this um, about the olia. Um, the fact that you know if you if you have the same mission, the same common goal as someone, then it is natural because you both have that same common aim that you'll you'll have a natural source of respect and admiration for that person. Um, you know, a sort of love, um, and the type of love we have for the Prophet, for example. Uh, peace be upon him, uh, the companions, um, and the male and female figures um, in uh, Islamic history. Now, you know, to clarify, this is a love which is pure, right? It's not something which is infatuation, or desire, or physical <coughs> attraction. Um, you know, different uh, languages have different words for that. The ancient Greeks had a word called agape for it. So, it's, it's not your kind of traditional uh, way of thinking of love. Like, and, you know, the best way of thinking, you know, when you have respect for the Prophet Islam or the male and female figures in history, the type of respect and care you have for them, this is what we should have um, when we're communicating, you know, the, the brotherhood and sisterhood, that kind of respect almost. Um, so yeah, the Arabic word for that is akuwa, as in brotherhood and sisterhood, and where it's love for the sake of Allah. Okay, so, uh, you know, I had no better way, but I think if you've seen Kung Fu Panda, it's a pretty good way of, you know, what this type of love is. Okay, um, and you know, just to quickly go into it, even this akua that we're talking about, even this has different levels. So you know, there's three kind of fundamental levels. The first kind of the lowest level is when you're only um, giving to other to the other person when you have more than you need, um, and that's kind of re realizes the lowest kind of level of this uh, level of friendship. The second is when you um, share equally. So you know, you get something for yourself, you get something for the other person as well. It's a kind of equal love. The highest level is where you actually have preference for the other person, the other person needs, the other person wants, over your own self. Um, and I think the best example is in the Holy Quran, the example of the Ansar of Medina. 
So also for those who were settled in Al-Madinah and adopted the faith before them, they love those who immigrated to them and find not any want in their breasts of what the immigrants were given, but preference over themselves, even though they are in privation. And whoever is protected from stinginess of his soul, it is those who will be successful. So i.e. essentially that they actually have preference um, for the immigrants over their own actual selves and their own needs and their own uh, wants. Okay, so now we're going to get to the crux of it, which is this, the interactive session. So, it's done. So, first scenario, very quickly, is Fizna and Jamal. Uh, Fizna touches Jamal's hand as she passes him a stethoscope. So, how would this be wrong, and how would, how could this be not wrong? I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, why does Jamal have Because he's the bro, and bros don't have stethoscopes. Yeah, we just roll. So. Uh, okay, yeah, but go on. So, uh, any ideas? So, what would make this wrong? If it was an accident or whether you intended to touch it. It's actually. So if, it, no, if just to clarify that for other brothers, if there was the actual intention that they wanted to touch the hands or whatever, then yeah. It's wrong. Then it's just weird. Then it's just weird, yeah. Fahad always sits next to Yasmin during PBLs. <laughs> so is that yay or nay? You can't be we have to be worried if Someone else, everyone else, no normal chairs, and then there's these two chairs joined at the hip. You know? <laughs> oh, that's that's Fahad and Yasmin's chair. Yeah. But again, um, this it comes down to the, the intention again. If Fahad is every single time purposefully looking for that scene, so Yasmin, where is she? And sitting next to her, then of course, apart from being weird, yeah, that's that's not right. But if it's okay, these are your allocated places set by the medical school. Fine, obviously, you know, shoving the seat something like that, but you know. I know we're all laughing, but. Deep down inside, I think every brother and sister has these concerns, yeah? And it's the question of figuring, sorting this out and sticking to the ideal, um, inshallah, yeah? <laughs> Habib always sends rude memes to Yusuf on Facebook. <laughs> Obviously, we know the answer is, yeah? That's it. Yeah, inappropriate. So, mm -hmm. so obviously, obviously, both ways, you know, it goes both ways. That brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, over any medium, for any reason. And this just goes for people in general. So, you know, like, our oh, language has just come so crude nowadays that I think. Uh, if we're to be examples to anyone, it needs to be, needs to be crystal clear in the way we speak as well sometimes. It's true. But you're moving stuff, you get so used to a certain type of language, you don't realise sometimes. Right? I feel like I'm in some kind of like chat show. <laughs> 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 I'm stuck in the ones, you know, being to one in a glass box. <laughs> I just got failed reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hakeem runs across the road without looking Sorry. to help his sister Naila who has fainted. So obviously, highway code, he's broken that, so that's clearly hollow, yeah? Um, Check your surroundings. First rule of basic life. It's okay? Yeah? Check your surroundings. We all know that's okay. It's okay, yeah? It's okay? yeah? We all know that's okay. Yeah. Uh, wait, um, the brother, handsome brother over here has a question. <laughs> Um, you mentioned and highlighted a lot throughout the talk of the importance of intentions. Um, but how would you tackle the situation or advise someone in a situation where they've actually fooled themselves into thinking they have good intentions, when in reality they don't? How do you know their intentions are? No, as in, it's, it's obviously you can't judge whether their intentions are good or not, but there are situations where sometimes when you reflect back, uh, at a later stage, you realize that you, your intentions might not be as pure. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the middle path, and he high, he's highlighted for us in the, in the guidelines, which you guys can find in, you guys can find in um, Sheikh Muslim Aparma. She has an amazing article called Co-ed Love, uh, Love for the Sake of Allah. Uh, everyone here should read the article, hands down. Yeah? So we're going to have a, you know, some reading for you guys to go back and read yourselves and show but. He's highlighted the middle path, and he highlights all the wrong turnings. So, even if someone has a weird intention, yeah, um, a everyone has to sort out their intention anyway. And this is a continuous process. <coughs> but that does not mean that you let go of the ideal for the sake of that. So, interact because right now 
my in intentions could be suspect as well. Am I speaking just so people can think, oh wow, Albert is so amazing? No one thinks that anyway, so that's a <laughs> negative intention. But everyone can play that game where, well, my, my uh, intentions are suspect, hence I'm not going to do anything. That's a trick of shaitan. Yeah? Do what is necessary, support your brothers and sisters, maintain the boundaries which are highlighted there, yeah? and work on your intention continuously. It's a case of having both. Purify your heart and maintain the ideal. No, I'm going to let go of the ideal, and I'm not going to even fix myself anyway. I'm just going to remain like some weirdo. Yeah? That's just that's, that's not the right way to do things. I think we can agree. Uh, yes, see, is that okay? oh, okay. And also, and another good way is just at the end of the day, um, say on if after Isha, just sit down for a few minutes and just go over kind of your interactions and what you did, and just honestly like ask yourself, you know, is this right? Don't make excuses for yourself. Even just otherwise, get a pen and paper, or think of it as if it was your if your brother did that. You know, would you approve of that? And just honestly, give yourself a few minutes. I think after salah sometimes is good because your head is clear, and just think, have I done right or have I done wrong? And after you've given yourself those few minutes, then you know, continue. I think it's a very good trick. You know, if you just do that every night, it helps a lot. Um, you see? Yeah. So, it's, um, you know, when sometimes it's difficult to remember while they're always watching you. Would you say that the ten rules that you just said, coming uh, for compliments or goes with um, thinking that what what my future wife or husband think if I did this? The reason why I'm not going on, I'm, I, I personally haven't said that, oh, just think about it yourself. If your heart says this is wrong, then this is wrong. And think about what so-and-so could say is, most of us aren't, aren't at that level yet. Yeah? So you can't get a fatwa from a, from a heart that has issues. And I, first and foremost, it's mine. Second thing is, that, well, maybe that guy does say, um, this is me playing shit on the advocate, yeah? But maybe that guy does say, well, yeah, I'm okay with my wife talking and mix, yeah, and doing whatever she wants to with other men. Yeah? So how is that guy, guy, guy going to uh, then decide what his actions are? So these guidelines cut through all of that you know, mental gymnastics. Um, rectify your intention, purify this, recognize what the ideal is, and practice, practice, practice. Yeah? until it gets to the stage which was at the Prophet at some time where they didn't have talk about gender relations. Yeah? They didn't have talk about marriages, they lived it. They lived the idea was prevalent in society. Where then they could get on with actually reforming society and building a better future as opposed to, oh my god, let's have another talk about you know, this and that and whatever. Yeah? Is that okay? Say that the wife or husband that you're born again in tune with your soul. So is there any need, as you mentioned in the beginning, to aim for these lofty things when your soul isn't conditioned or even willing to accept these rules? This is the ideal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents. Yeah. One thing I forgot to mention is that we learned this in the first verse of the Quran, yeah? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Yeah? He's the master, and he says, Rabb, he's the master, straight away we realize, we're the slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents the ideal. Yeah? Because he's the master, he has all the rights. Yeah? So he presents the ideal to his slave. And he tells his slave, if you follow this ideal, you will I'll take care of you. Every one of your concerns, I'll take care of you. As we witness in Musa Islam story, as we witness in Maryam Islam who gave birth to a prophet, yeah, Isa Islam, yeah. And as we witness countless times in the Prophet Islam's life and the companions. That when they made st stuck to this ideal, it wasn't a question of let me try to do some logic, you know, or mental gymnastics. It's a question of what's the ideal. Now we presented some of the benefits of this ideal, but the ideal remains. So it's not a question of, for me at least, it's not a question of well, could this or that or whatever happen. Yeah, it's a question of what was the ideal. It has clearly worked in the Qur'an, in history, clearly worked. Everything at the moment that is being presented to us has not worked. That has worked. So, it's proof enough that he's, Allah SWT is the one who's telling us to do this. But the fact that he's shown us that this works, getting in your head it works, yeah, is enough reason for me to say, this makes sense, 
I'm going to stick to, I'm the slave. I don't even need to make, it doesn't even need to make sense to me, but Allah SWT, out of mercy has explained it to us, so let me just proceed on this journey now. This is the middle pathway. Yeah? If you know your intention is clear, and it's all good. But you don't know the other person's intention, and it might start off good, but during time, you, you never know what the other person's intention is. So, how do you think there's any point going there? Um, yeah, uh, well, so let me clarify. You're saying that if I'm helping sister, no, no, if I'm helping Aisha with uh, lifting her box, and I know that my intentions are clear, but her isn't. Something like that. Yeah. So, like, um, Allah SWT presents the ideal, yeah? Each person is responsible for his or own actions. We're not doing anything suspect here, yeah? We're doing what is necessary, what Allah SWT has asked us to do, commanded us to do, yeah? Be supportive to one another. I can only control my intentions. If your intention is suspect, it doesn't matter if your intention is suspect, because we're not getting into a situation where something can happen. If we, that's why the guidelines are there. Even if someone had the most twisted intentions, I'm never, nothing is ever going to happen where you're like, oh no, what happened now? What's the worst, what's the worst case scenario? I helped you with your box. <laughs> you can have the worst intention in the universe. I did what I needed to do. Yeah? So time and time again, we're seeing that by following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and the conditions that He's provided, yeah, we can see that it cuts through all the logic that we, we're bringing up and it cuts through any potential situations that could occur, any dangers that we could be in. You know, because so, regardless of what their intentions are, it doesn't matter. You know, they can have the weirdest intentions in the universe. My intentions, I'm striving for it to be pure. I'm only doing what's necessary. I'm not, I have clean speech, <coughs> clear speech, um, you know, and so on with these conditions. I'm not alone with her. So nothing really can happen. Nothing really can happen. Yeah. I think basically, in a nutshell, what I've been saying is it's a fail-proof method. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's no avenue, it doesn't allow anything bad to happen. It's catered for all the different things which can happen, and this blocks anything. Even if the other person's intention is bad, it blocks that from happening. That's the whole point of this. But it, it all depends on if you adhere to that guidance, that set of rules, that ideal. I'm sorry, it's just a question. So, what if people construe being formal as being rude or lacking social skills? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I guess it's just the way you do it. Uh, the example of the Prophet Sassam was that he was never seen as being rude. He was formal, but he was never being seen as rude. And we see this example continuously uh, in ward rounds, in case discussions. If you're talking to a professor, it's not a case of, well, this is rude. You're just being formal, you're being polite. Um, so we're practicing this as we speak. Yeah, I hope none of you think we're rude. Yeah. Well, but we're being formal. This formal doesn't mean Shakespeare language. Formal means be direct. Yeah. Be direct, be to the point, say what you need to, and say it in a in a good manner. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Show me the example of the of the Sahabiya who couldn't hear something and she asked. The the Sahabiya? Yeah, who couldn't hear something and she asked the Sahaba next to her. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. yeah, okay. So at the time the Prophet saw some, there was uh, the Prophet was giving a khutbah and one of the female companions she couldn't hear what the Prophet said so she turned to who? a male companion and she said a, uh, this is a ye old trans translation yeah? but you know, basically hey that's what she was saying hey, what did she say? and then she said may Allah SWT reward you this is a female companion and this is transmitted to us she could have asked... And she didn't know this person at all. Yeah, she didn't know this person at all. And she could have asked the Prophet when he was in private. She could have uh, waited you know, for a few years later. She could have waited when the Prophet was alone with only women. But she asked this question because, as we can see, that's a good example. She's maintained to all the ideals. If that, question, if that person has the weirdest mentality in the world, it doesn't matter. I'm asking you a question. I need help. Finish. Matter of time before this actual talk started, so uh, it's very rare not to find a room in Garrett, but because of the interviews happening and all the other rooms are taken up, the sisters are actually running around looking for a place. And I thought, um, well, ask one of the organisers, what about 3.06? Because I remember that we were going to, we have this room booked anyway, um, but the reply was, oh no, the brothers are all in there.
So um, for me, I don't know, I thought in a practical side of view, just so if we don't find anywhere the options are for us to run back to the hospital prayer room and try to make it in time for this, or our options are to wait until <coughs> it's finished to come out, or the other option is if, if space permits and that the brothers can move forward like it has been done in certain situations, the sisters can come at the back and pray more them together. Um, so what is your idea of the situation and what do you think is the best thing? Um, uh, I don't like to present uh, so my, uh, my own ideas, but as in for this situation, feel free, anyone to disagree. But, I mean, I was actually thinking, like, oh my god, there's no sisters coming. Because why, why haven't they come through yet praying Mokra? It's almost 10 minutes at a time, so uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, but, uh, yeah, we should, have, we should have made space. That's one thing. Um, I, I didn't think the sister would do that, but yeah, it's, it's something that does happen on campus, so we should have made space, number one. And yeah, there's no, there's no harm in brothers and sisters praying in the same room. Um, I think it's when, you know, like, if we stick to the prophets and some of these examples, this is what they did. They had men at the front, women at the back. Um, and with regards to worship obligations, this is the example that they had. They had no barrier in between the two. Um, it was there was no iron curtain, um, so if we stick to that example, then yeah, sisters. If you had nowhere else to, I mean, if it was, if, it was, if this room was big enough, and if we had enough space, and we should have had made space. Uh, so I'm not looking at you. I should be looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we should have made space. Then uh, yeah, definitely, you, um, sisters should have prayed in this room. And I, I think that highlights another point as well, a case in point, which is that both brothers and sisters have to be proactive. So for example, we as brothers, we knew that there'd be sisters coming. So we had to proactively think, okay, we have to pray mother, if they would have to pray mother as well, there might not be space. So we should have shifted to the front. And that's also part of that kind of creating that, because you're creating a safe atmosphere, uh, which is preventing um, any problems uh, occurring and also catering, you know, this type of friendship, uh, that, not friendship, the uh, kind of... The physical, physical interaction. Physical at, interaction. At, at the time of the Prophet Islam, they only had one entrance. Yeah, and one exit. The men and women had to go both, go through the same exit, and they did. They only had separate exits. This is often misinterpreted that oh, they had separate exits because men and women have to be separate from each other as the distance between the sun and the moon. Yeah, but the reason the Prophet was some game was that it was because of overcrowding. So to use that example, if, if we were praying in this room and it was this you know tiny room like the ones downstairs where there's no room and we'd inevitably end up you know pushing and shoving. Yeah. Then obviously that's not appropriate. Like a song,